Okie dokie, let's talk about partnerships. Partnerships are when two or more people get together to engage in a business. And since uh, what little thinking I do, I do on a linear basis, let's look at partnerships in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. Over the years, uh, there's been a lot of famous and successful partnerships. Maybe one partner knows about technology and the other knows about marketing. Maybe one partner knows about the restaurant business and the other knows about accounting. Whatever it is, when they two or more people combine their various resources, they can form a better, stronger company than they would have had on their own. Big picture from an accounting standpoint, there really isn't that much different. We'll still have an income statement with revenue minus expenses, but over here in the owner's capital section, we won't just have one owner's capital account, we'll have one for each partner. So that means our statement of owner's equity is going to track each individual partner's capital account. Owner's capital at the beginning, plus net income, minus owner's drawings, gives us owner's capital at the end. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of a partnership. It's a separate legal entity. It has its own federal tax ID number, for example. It's a separate accounting entity, so it'll have separate books for just that thing. And the net income is not taxed as a separate entity. The tricky part about these two things up here is anytime a partner leaves or comes in, that existing partnership is terminated. But we still keep the books. We don't throw out our old books and start all over again. We just make an adjustment to the capital accounts. Uh, net income is not taxed as a separate entity, but it does file a tax return. I call it a tattletale tax return. It's a form 1065. Yeah. So my friend Charles and I form a lemonade stand business. During the first year of operation, it makes $10,000. We allocate $5,000 to Charles and $5,000 to me. The 1065 tells the IRS that, and so the IRS knows to look out and look on my tax return to make sure I claim that $5,000 worth of income. So there's the concept of mutual agency. Any partner can act on behalf of the other partners. So Charles and I form our lemonade stand business and Charles goes down to Home Depot and buys a bunch of wood uh, and tells them that he's going to build a lemonade stand when in fact he uses that wood to build himself a cabin in the woods. Uh, I'm still liable because any partner can act on behalf of the other partner so long as the act appears to be appropriate for the partnership. As I said before, a dissolution occurs whenever a partner withdraws or a new partner is admitted, but that doesn't mean the business ends. So Charles brings in his son uh, Ryan into our uh, lemonade business. Technically, legally, that old partnership between Charles and I is terminated, but that doesn't mean we start our uh, accounting records all over again. We just keep going with the same accounting records and we keep running the business the same way. We just have new input from the new partner. And kind of the downside, the scary part of a, a general partnership is that each partner is personally and individually liable for all the partnership liabilities. So my partner goes down to Home Depot and buys lots and lots of wood to build himself a cabin in the woods and then declares bankruptcy. I might have to pay for that even though I didn't get any benefit from it. So like we said, uh, the unlimited liability is kind of scary, but one way around that is to form a limited partnership. So you have one general partner and he or she is liable for everything. Everyone else just puts in their thousand or the $10,000 and they're not allowed to uh, help manage the business. They are a limited partner and all they can lose is their original capital contribution. There's something called the limited liability partnership. So if you have a bunch of doctors that work together and one of them commits malpractice, it isn't fair that all of them uh, have to go out of business because of a horrible malpractice of one partner. So there are no general partners in that. Everyone has limited liability. And they're also responsible for their own malpractice, for example. And then the modern day version of the half partnership, half corporation is something called the limited liability company. And that entity, the members, they're not called partners, they're called members, all have limited liability based on what they put in to the limited liability company. There's co-ownership of the property. So once I put in, say, my $5,000 cash into the uh, Charles and Russ lemonade stand, that cash now belongs to the partnership. It doesn't belong to me anymore. And I don't have a claim on those specific assets. And then we have to have an agreement about how we share the net income or net loss. We'll talk about that in partnerships, the middle. 
but hopefully you have a written agreement that talks about how you share it. If you don't have any agreement, then uh, the courts will just say, hey, it's 50-50 for losses and 50-50 for net income. So the accounting at the beginning of the partnership is really simple. Assets go on the books for their fair value. Remember, fair value is accounting shorthand for fair market value. It doesn't matter what that asset or that liability was on our books for before, we care about what it's worth, and that's what the debit or the credit is to on our partnership books. So students sometimes struggle with problem 12-1A. I, I don't think it's the concept, I think it's the way it's worded. So let's go over the first part of this together and it'll give you a feel for the accounting at the beginning. So Sorensen and Lucas are gonna form a partnership. They had companies before, so they had their own set of books. But we don't really care about what the value of the assets were. For example, Sorensen had inventory on his books for 26.5. It's really worth 28,000. So that's what we care about when we make our journal entry. And two more specific things. Uh, Sorensen had on his uh, balance sheet accounts receivable 17.5 with an allowance for doubtful accounts of three. Just because he contributes these accounts receivable to a new partnership doesn't mean that magically all his customers are going to pay him. He thought before $3,000 of customers weren't going to pay him. Now, by the way, when he thinks about it a little bit harder, he realizes that there's $4,500 worth of customers that probably aren't going to pay him. And equipment goes on our books at fair market value, just like we said, and we start depreciating them all over again. So we're not going to bring over any accumulated depreciation. So let's skip down and do part B first. Uh, these guys put in their uh, individual assets and individual liabilities from their companies, but they're also going to add additional cash. So Sorensen will invest an additional $5,000 cash. We debit cash and credit instead of just owner's capital, we now have an account called Sorensen Capital because we're going to keep track of their capital accounts separately. And the cash goes in at fair value. How much is $5,000 worth of cash worth? Well, it's worth $5,000. Students sometimes want to stick Sorensen cash in here, but remember, once he contributes that, ca that cash, he doesn't own it anymore. It belongs to the partnership. So we debit cash, credit Sorensen capital. So why don't you pause this video and see if you can create uh, the journal entry for part A for Sorensen. In other words, debit and credit the asset and liability accounts for their fair value, and then whatever it takes to make that journal entry balance becomes a credit to Sorensen's capital account. I hope you got it. The cash goes on at its fair value, which is $14,000. Account receivable goes on at its fair value, which also happens to be the same as its book value, 17,005. But the allowance for doubtful accounts, that contra asset account, was on Sorensen's books for 3,000. He says, on further reflection, probably $4,500 worth of my customers aren't going to pay me. So we credit allowance for doubtful accounts for its fair value of $4,500. Inventory may have been on his book for $26,500, but the inventory is really worth $28,000. So we debit inventory of $28,000. The equipment was on his books for $45,000 with $24,000 of accumulated depreciation. We don't care about that. We're going to start depreciating it all over again. We just put it on our books for what its fair value is, which is $25,000. The liability accounts evidently have the same fair value as book value. So we credit notes payable for 18, credit accounts payable for 22. And the difference to make this journal entry balance is the credit to Sorensen Capital for $40,000. So big picture, there's lots of good reasons to enter into a partnership. It allows for pooling of resources and talents. And as long as we're careful about the unlimited liability possibilities and handling the formation of the partnership so that everyone gets exactly what they think they're going to get, it's a great way to do business. And what we care about from the accounting point of view is we debit and credit the assets and liabilities for their fair value when they first contributed to the partnership at the beginning.